okay, let's talk about world building. Um, the, the metaphor I like best is George Martin's and he talks about architects and gardeners. Mm. And um, I asked Lev Grossman this recently and he said, I'm sure that nobody's uh, purely one or the other. I'd love to debate him on that because I know some people who sit down with, with nary a thought and, you know, and they can mm -hmm. just produce story. Um, but where, where do you fall on the continuum? Well, I think the people who sit down like that and just sort of do it on the spur of the moment, I don't... I could be wrong, but I've never met anyone who does that who also creates worlds completely from scratch yeah. that are completely self... internally self-consistent. I mean, my feeling is that when you're creating... creating a world, you need to keep track of what you're doing. You know, what are the rules of magic? What is the history? What are the names? What are the languages? All these different things. That's what makes it work. Mm. For me, as a reader and as, as a writer, I am definitely one of the people who plans things out beforehand, but I also let things evolve as I'm writing. It's a combination of the two. Uh, but I need enough of a framework going into a story to be able to play, so to speak. Yeah. And if I don't have a framework, I can't write. You know, I yeah. li I'll literally get a, co I'll get a cool idea, start writing, get three, four pages in, and then it's like running into a brick wall. It's like, okay, what happens now? Uh, and you know, and with a long series, you don't want to be killing someone off in book one, you're going to need a book four, right? right? Which I did hear about one author who did that and oh, caused some problems. Oh, <laughs> so, you know, we sat on that epic fantasy, fantasy panel at Comic-Con. Right. The, the, the one I was, maybe it was just because it was the most comic, but was Kevin G. Anderson's, and he said, look, you wouldn't hire um, someone to build a building who's just going to show up with a bunch of material. You exactly. want them to have a blueprint. <laughs> There's for me. For, there's some truth in that. Um, I'm like you. I think I find a lot of stuff along the way, but I start with some structure. Yeah, and it helps. It, it guides me. I mean, the stuff I find along the way usually is character stuff. Yeah, and that can end up influencing the structure of the story. That actually happened in this last book, uh, but usually the structure is established beforehand. And of course, the structure is driven by the characters and who the characters are. So you need to have a good idea of who they are before you begin. I mean, it's it's a mix. Um, and I used to outline, I mean, my first two, my first three books, I outlined in extraordinarily tight detail. Uh, for example, for Brissinger, it was 14 pages, single-spaced, you know, paragraph for each chunk of events going through. Mm. Uh, but it was so tightly outlined that when I wrote it, I almost felt a little bit stifled by the outline. It was kind of like, okay, just coloring in the lines now, this is boring. So with the last book, I left myself a little more freedom. And I'm glad I did. It was it was more fun. Yeah, uh, I can totally see that. Even if I did have to rewrite a chapter or two. Yeah, I have this interesting mix. There's places where um, I'll have a lot of uh, information about mm -hmm. a chapter, and there's some that will just say, you know, this guy dies, yeah. and and I just go from there. Yeah. Well, you know, the uh, the analogy I always use when I'm giving presentations, and I have like, young writers asking me about this, is that for me, and again, it's different for everyone. For me, writing is like music. It's very hard to perform a piece of music while, to, excuse me, it's very hard to compose a piece of music while you're performing it. Mm -hmm. So first you compose it, and then you can concentrate on performing it as beautifully as possible. Yeah. Uh, if you're composing while you're performing, then you're probably doing jazz, and that's something else entirely. With jazz, the way I think the metaphor holds up mm. is that jazz musicians have a whole set of modes. Mm -hmm. um, and so they know when they get into a mode and a key, yeah. Um, they have a framework that they're playing against, mm -hmm. and then they can do all sorts of noodling yeah. inside of that, and it still makes sense with in, inside the song. Right, you still have a framework that gives you... Yeah, gives you and bells. so it, yeah. it can feel fresh in that the note selections and, and rhythms that they'll choose um, can vary mm -hmm. like widely, um, and it's still in the same family of sound. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually think the metaphor continues to, to work well. Fair enough. So, fair enough. Um, okay, so let's talk about the familiar and the new. Or, uh, the strange, sorry, the familiar and strange. And it's this notion, you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, Terry. He's mm -hmm. defined a little bit by early early stuff, mm -hmm. and a lot of it's so familiar. And some people will say it's harkened back to other work. Um, and, and, you know, there are some readers who, you know, feel very passionately that, that the only work that matters is work that is entirely of the strange, you know, mm -hmm. what is unfamiliar to them. Um, and so this is, this is, Definitely a reader preference thing. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts about that, and, and maybe it doesn't in, enter your mind as you're approaching your particular stories, but, um, you know, there are certain conventions of the genre. There are. And so, Well, when I, when I set out to write Aragon, I was very conscious of what I was doing. I was very conscious of the fact that I was going to try... I mean, because 
again, I was aware of the places I was deficient, so to speak. And so my thought was, I was going to take the elements that I enjoyed about fantasy. You know, the wise old mentor, the magic sword, the dragon, the elves, the dwarves, the evil villain, the young hero. And I was going to, I wanted to pay tribute to uh, the genre. And also, like jazz, like you were saying, it was an established framework that would allow me to sort of play around within the conventions of the genre, and it provided sort of a safe bedrock for me as an author starting out, because I knew that these elements worked. Yeah. That these were stories that, you know, these sorts of stories, these coming-of-age stories, these heroic quests go back thousands and thousands of years. They're right. the oldest form of story. So I knew that gave me a certain safety net as an author starting out. And also, I mean, I loved these books, these stories growing up, and so really, I really wanted to sort of almost almost write a love note to the genre. Yeah. And I wasn't trying to do something completely new or original. Uh, what, what, I, what I was trying to do that was new and original was sort of my voice, my take on an established kind of story. And uh, that appeals to some readers, and it doesn't appeal to other readers. But as you said, it's really a personal preference. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a one of the one of these conventions is the is the note the dichotomy of good and evil, mm -hmm. and I know that there are, there are writers today, and not just in fantasy, but they eschew the idea entirely. It's like it's an outdated, you know, e evil is only selfishness, or yeah. evil is as evil does. Um, and I was at a I was at a Worldcon once, and there was a, a panel on this. And I forget the name of the, the writer, but he, at one end. And I, I, I talked to um, Rothfuss about this. At one end, there was a scientist, mm -hmm. social scientist. He says, look, you know, evil is crime. It's the lack of empathy. It's these kinds of mm -hmm. things. What, what man, man's inhumanity to man. And on the other end is this writer. And after lots of really very high-minded discussion, uh -huh. he kind of leans forward and he looks, looks down and he says, you know, and pardon my French here, but i got to sell this. He says, pardon my, uh, he said, you know, when you feel evil, you fucking know it. <laughs> and like, I got a little chill. It's like, yeah, you, you kind of do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, fantasy trades Assuming you're not this. a psychopath. Right. Psychopaths, we'll talk about those later. Um, but, so I'm interested in your, in your, in your thoughts on this because um, some feel that fantasy does this really well. Mm -hmm. Like, it's a good opportunity to be able to explore that in a way mm -hmm. that is safe, in that it's a second world and you're not here and you don't have to get religious about it. Yeah. Um, what I are mean, thoughts? it depends on the author. I mean, it depends how you deal with it. I mean, you can go very, very black and white with it. Uh, Tolkien's a perfect example of that. Yeah. Uh, you know, if if you're born an orc, you're evil. Sorry, no, no, no yes. redos there. <laughs> uh, if you're born an elf, you're good. Uh, if uh, unless you know, unless the bad guys get a hold of you and turn you into an orc, but uh, we'll ignore right. that. Right. Uh, so, you know, you can be very black and white with it, and sometimes that works for stories and is very appealing to the readers. Other times a more nuanced approach is uh, nice. I mean, I was talking with Rothfuss about this, that personally, I didn't feel comfortable having entire species that were either good or bad. Right. You know, and that was one of the things I did consciously in my books, where I start off with sort of the stereotypical evil monsters and, you know, the ergols, and they've got big horns, and, you know, you think they're just the cannon fodder. And then the second book and later books, I turned it around and showed that, well, okay, they're not human, but they're not inherently evil either. Right. Um, you know, they might come down and, you know, kill everyone and burn your village, but humans are kind of doing that to them as well. You know, right. it balances they out. They may have reasons. They might have reasons, exactly. Yeah. And uh, I don't really believe in 100%, I mean, there certainly are evil people. Mm -hmm. I, I, I definitely believe that. Uh, but I always think that there are reasons for, for that sure. behavior. It's not just something that comes out of nowhere. You don't just say this person was just born evil. Or if maybe if they were born evil, there's a very good reason they were born evil, and let's right. go back and look at that as well. Right. And to me that makes things much more interesting than just saying black-white. For sure. I, I would agree with that 100%. Um, but I'll go on record as saying I, uh, I actually tire of, of um, work that is so effusively gray that there's no one to cheer for. Mm, that too. That um, too. But go, I want to go back to one thing for yeah, a minute, yeah. though. You uh, talking about why I wrote Aragon and everything. Um, you might appreciate this. Okay, so I'm 14. I'm getting close to graduating from high school, and I was starting to write again because I had written before high school, and I didn't do almost any writing during high school because it wasn't assigned for some reason. And I was starting to get back into it, so I was starting to write a number of different books, and I kept 
running my head against a wall after three, four pages, like I mentioned, because I didn't know what happened next. Yeah. So I was extremely methodical then and now. So I said, I don't know what I don't know. So I stopped writing, and I read a bunch of books on how to write. So I wrote, I read Story by Robert McKee. Oh, great one. Characters and Viewpoint by Orson Scott Card. Uh, the Writer's Handbook, a couple of those, uh, Writer's Market, a few others. And when I felt like, because I envision stories and plots like skeletons, for whatever reason, not actual skeletons, but I imagine like frameworks in my head. Yeah. And I started saying, okay, you know what, I need to plot out a story. I'm not going to write it. I'm just going to plot out a book to see if I can plot it out. So I created this whole fantasy world. Uh, it was starring a, a, elf, a princess named Arya. And I, I built up this whole world and series and plotted out, and actually not series, it was just one story. I plotted out the whole story, and I never wrote it. I still have the outline. I put it aside and I said, okay, now I know I can plot a story. Now I'm going to plot a trilogy, because of all great, all great fantasy For stories sure, are trilogies, right? right? <laughs> I'm going to plot a trilogy, and then I'm going to write the first one as a practice book. As I said, I'm very, very, very methodical. Yeah. It's going to be just to see if I can get 500 pages or so. And I'm not going to publish it or do anything else with it. It's just a practice book. So I plotted out the trilogy, worked out the world, and, and again, the thought was this is just practice, and then I'll go write a real book. Yeah. Well, the practice book was Aragon. Yeah. And I just finished my practice book a few months ago, so to speak, 13 yeah. years later. So now I get to go write my real book. That's hysterical. Yeah, well, we'll look forward to that. We'll talk about that one in a minute, too. Um, is there a theme in your work? But meaning, and you and if so, do you start with it, or does it happen, and you go back and think, oh, mm. there's some underpinning I wasn't aware of. No, I, 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 a lot of the work deals with questions of uh, power. You know, how do people responsibly handle power? What is and what is your, you know, what is moral, what is not? Uh, there are questions of religion in the series as well. Uh, questions of you know, how do you live a good life and. Um, Things like that. I mean, I think those are questions everyone thinks about when growing up. So yeah. they are questions I was dealing with growing up, and having that in the series to me made it more interesting than if I hadn't. And I think it gave it a little bit something more than than some fantasy stories that don't have that sort of stuff. You know, and ignoring that sort of stuff to me is ignoring a very large part of life. Yeah.